one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Man Almost Said Another Edition of Coffee with Conrad. And I forgot to do my surprise thing. I'm all blabbing oh. out over here. I normally go. <gasps> Welcome, everyone. Right. This is Conrad and Susan from ConradRocks.net. We have a passion for the lukewarm lighting, the lukewarm back on fire for Jesus. I have a passion for helping people develop a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus, the, the, the Jesus the Bible talks about. Amen. And my, Amen. Anchor, my anchor texts are usually Acts chapter 9. You know how Saul knew the Bible, but he didn't know Jesus, and he was using the Bible to persecute Christians, and then he meets Jesus and he walks after the Spirit. I know I'm talking fast, but ponder that. He knew the text, but he didn't know the author, and then he meets him. So um, that's what we're about. Amen. You can Amen. Share this out, and you know we're, we'll we'll watch the questions. If they're on topic, we may even address them. Amen. Susan has some announcements, I think. A few. Uh, one is kind of a backward announcement. It's we had a women's conference at our church, and it was so good that the men came too. <laughs> Not really. They sat in the back row and kind of eavesdrop it. She is very, uh, she's a prophetic, uh, I don't really know what, how you describe Londa. She's just really exciting. And she had some uh, a great message and the women loved it. And we were all just, I don't know, just encouraged. It was a great weekend. Uh, Conrad got to play on the music team, on the worship team, and I was on the worship team. So we enjoyed that. And of course, just fellowshipping with her and her daughter. That that to me, I think that's going to be a connection. You may hear more about Londa's daughter. I think her name's Sonia. I think that's right. Uh, we're going to talk about her later, but just keep your ear out for that. We are going to be going to Conway, Arkansas, this month. He is going to be doing a conference with Jennifer Leclaire. If you don't know her, she is the editor of Charisma Magazine. Uh, he and Jennifer and another lady, I don't have her name written in front of me, so I can't remember, uh, but they will be doing a conference and it's a, uh, revival. Um, what is it? Revival rising, I think is the name of it. It's going to be awesome. And it's going to be the weekend before Thanksgiving. So we'll be going to that. We're just we don't know what the Lord's going to do, but we just have a feeling we're supposed to meet this man. And we say that because there's so many times that Conrad's when he does his shows, I can't even explain to you how amazingly often this happens, but he'll be doing a show, uh, his coffee with Conrad. And then I'll click on Ryan Lestrange while he's doing the show. He doesn't even know this. He'll come out and sure enough, the very thing he is doing his show on Ryan's talking about the same stuff. So they, they kind of go in the same vein. They talk about the same stuff and we just, we really like him. So we're going to go check him out. Never seen him in person, seen him online a lot. And then at the next week we'll be going to a concert. We're actually going to be, it's a family thing. It's kind of a fun thing, but my family is full of musicians. Um, Conrad has met them and he's got, he's now a part of the family. So we're going to all, Praise and Worship the Lord at South Luverne Baptist Church in Luverne, Alabama. My brother Perry plays the guitar and sings. My brother Bert plays the guitar and he sings, but he doesn't ever like to sing. So I doubt he will, but he'll play his guitar. My uh, brother's son, PJ, is a worship leader at Three Circle Church in, I can't tell you where it is. It's in South Alabama somewhere, but him and his wife are both worship leaders. His other son is a keyboard player for Gateway in Grand Prairie, Texas, and his wife is a worship leader. So it's like we got a whole bunch of musicians. And my mother is an accomplished pianist. I don't know if anybody in this audience has heard her, maybe, but she's um, she's going to play her grand piano. And it's going to be fun. But I will we'll have a good time just praising and worshiping and enjoying each other's company and inviting some folks to come see us. So if you're in South Alabama, uh, the week of Thanksgiving, you can come visit. We'd love to have you. Amen. I want to give a shout out to Will and Carrie LeBlanc came all the way from Google Plus. It's good Welcome. to see you over here. She was like on, you know, my phone doesn't get blab. She's probably watching it on the browser. That's awesome. good. Amen. It works great on the browser. I mean, really, yeah. it really does. It looks good. Yeah, it's okay. It's still in beta. All right. That's true. 
Now about the conference that we went to, I, I know this is the preliminary stuff, but I just got to share. Londa Choate, I have her testimony. Now, for those of you that want to hear an amazing testimony, I was talking mm -hmm. to someone about a testimony earlier. Londa Choate had multiple sclerosis. She was on her way. She was knocking on death's door with multiple uh, strokes, fetal position, mind of a two-year-old. Some people get the idea that healing is for today. She gets yep. healed. 17 family members gets just give their lives to the Lord that day because she gets healed. And then her doctor even gets saved. It's an amazing testimony. You can check it out the testimonies label at conradrocks.net. And she had a yeah, conference. Man. I mean, she's just, it was pretty awesome. So it was. All right, let's pray in and then I guess I'll we'll do it. And if you guys awesome. have if you have questions, you know, you can put them in here. If they're on topic, we may address them. So amen. And we can feature them like Google Plus. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord to lift up the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that this chapter is the chapter to start doing the Blab Bible studies with, Lord. Lord, we exalt your name. We seek you, Lord, and may you anoint our tongues to be the pen of a ready writer. Lord, may people come in one way and leave better at the end of this broadcast, Lord. May, may we have a word in season that unlocks. You know, I love it that you say, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Well, Lord, pour out truth today. Pour out the truth. Touch someone today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So I'm going to just quickly read. I read fast. So he does. I, I but we'll been, read through slow as we talk about it. So I could have been. And if y'all don't know, it's First Corinthians chapter two. So you may want to get that open and just kind of refer to it. I could have been the FedEx guy. Let me tell you. And you remember him? Yeah. Okay. And I, brethren, when I came to you, not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And in my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I love that. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God and a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for they, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which have God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of God, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Amen comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I get excited. I'm not going to apologize. Mm -hmm. But the natural man uh, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Awesome. Amen. Amen. So, guys, the, the guys that are new, to this we normally do it verse by verse, and uh, you know, or thought by thought. Usually, sometimes two or three verses compose one thought. With Paul, he tends to run on, and sometimes one verse has ten thoughts in it. So, <laughs> or he'll say the same thing multiple different ways over and over. And we're also doing this chronological. Are we doing this chronologically yes. by the by the way they were written or the events took place? The order they were written. Okay. Uh, as best we know, that's not set in stone. There's a lot okay. of argument about what's written, how old yeah. these books are, but we're going chronologically. We've done Galatians. Uh, we've done First and Second Thessalonians. Right. What else did we do? We did we did Romans first, and then we decided to do them, do them chronologically. So we're out of order there, but. Yeah, just anyway. so you guys know that the the books of the Bible are not in order chrono, uh, chronologically. They're from size. This is interesting. They start out with with Romans, and you'll notice they get smaller, and then all of a sudden Hebrews is big. So when the council put them together, 
Uh, I'm kind of thinking they thought that Paul wasn't the author of Hebrews, right. which is interesting. So I think anyway, so. now, okay. And I, brethren, when I come to you, not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. The testimony of God. Yeah. Eloquent words don't save people. Mm-hmm. And he, this is the thrust of what we, what we talk about at Conrad Rock's um, is having a spiritual relationship mm-hmm. with the Jesus the text talks about. That's true. And yeah. Go ahead. I'd like to contribute here that if you look in the Bible at the at the disciples, um, there was criticism of the disciples by the people of that day. They would look at them and say, well, these are not learned men. You have to remember they were in a culture in Greece. If you go back into that time, especially if you're a study, if you study history and I'm a a mathematician. I mean, I've been a math teacher my whole life. So I know a lot about Euclid, Pythagoras and all these other mathematicians. That culture was highly logical and everything was, it was all, you know, your status was, was wrapped up in your ability to speak and instruct others and so when these men came along that were not learned they knew they'd not gone to synagogue that much they had not you know they weren't like the pharisees who'd studied the torah and memorized it they just were ordinary fishermen like peter so they were i'm sure astounded at the speech of these men, especially Peter on the day of Pentecost when he preached and 3,000 people were saved. You had to know those people were in awe of this ordinary man saying such extraordinary things. It wasn't the speech itself. It was the power of God that was in that speech that made all the difference. Well, let's, let's back up for a little bit and let's make sure that people understand that Paul was highly capable of intellectual wrangling. He was said at the... Paul pe- was, yeah. The, the author of this particular... Yeah. text is Paul and he's just the opposite. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. Mm-hmm. He was incredibly educated. So he's kind of making the point, don't that's not what's important. It's not excellency of speech that I'm making or wisdom, but it's because it's the testimony of God. That's what makes it important. So I think he's trying to Yeah, he's instructing them not to worry so much about th- that part, but what he's saying is is what's anointed of God is what's important. Also, when Paul went to preach at Mars Hill, I forget when it was in Acts, but we were, we were, we were reading, he was, he was reasoning and alleging with them, but there was no church started there. You know, that's right. It's interesting that stuff that happens in the Bible, like in Acts, especially, we think that sometimes we use that as a model, but we don't often look at it in the way maybe that God intended for us to look at it. Sometimes they, they did things that maybe we shouldn't do just because they did it. Didn't mean God told them to do it necessarily. Like for example, that that's a great example. When they went to Mars Hill, was that anointed of God or not? It's in the Bible. It happened. They spoke those words. They told the truth, but you just don't see any evidence or any fruit from that encounter. And another one that comes to mind in the, in Acts is when they cast the lots. Remember that? When they cast the lots for Matthias. And my dad pointed this out to me not too long ago, and I thought, you know, I never really thought about that. But do you realize we never heard his name ever mentioned again in the book of Acts or anywhere in the Bible? Yet that's how they chose that apostle? Well, you can, it's something to ponder. You, you could get in some wrangling there because they're actually quoting a scripture. Let him, another man yeah. take his office, and but you know, yeah. Paul, Paul was an apostle out of due season. I mean, I'm just like on, you know, maybe we don't you, know. Uh, why is that happening? But who knows? You know, who knows? It's even the proverb says the the will of the Lord comes from the lot falling in the lap. Uh, they had the Urim and the Thummim, which is on the priest, which would supposedly that's light true. up. That's true. It, it, so I, I don't know. I mean, that's something we could speculate on. We don't know, but I think it's a good point to make. You know, just because you see it written down somewhere in the Bible doesn't mean you need to rush out and do it. You need to consult with the Spirit to make that, sure. Now, that's a good point. Now, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Now, the testimony of God, 
the testimony of God also was obviously talking about the things that he had done. You know, I'm talking about the things that God has done, the tests that people have gone through. And there's nothing like testimonies. I do testimonies on my blog. They're powerful. People get saved by hearing testimonies, and I never get tired of it. So he went from intellectual wrangling, you know, like how did they get all those animals on the boat? Uh, how was the universe created? Uh, how does that prove God? And how does it prove the Christian? He did. He just dumped all that. I was blind, but now I see. How about that? That's guy? right. And he just <laughs> ended. Uh, that was mom yeah. gave that example yeah. last week. You know, the guy that was healed by Jesus, the Pharisees were all grilling him about it. Well, what what happened exactly? And he's like, I don't know who he is. Like they were asking him who he thought he was. And you see God or whatever. And he was saying, I don't know who he is. I just know I was blind and now I can see. That testimony was powerful. Amen. So he kind of shut him up. It ended the conversation. So. so he's continuing this thought here for I determined. Now he's determined at this point. Not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The Corinthians was an extremely, uh, they had the thousand, house of a thousand harlots. I mm. mean, that, that was yeah, a this wicked was a town. Very wicked. Mm -hmm. And Paul Paul had probably learned from the, his Mars Hill experience, you know, I'm not going to try to reach them through their culture. Let's just let's just talk about Jesus. Yeah. And, and that worked. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine having the Corinthian church as your church? Oh man, I know we think we have it tough now. That was a wick. That was a very messed up church. Amen. People don't realize when they're reading First Corinthians the type of issues that are going on. We sometimes skim over that. <clears throat> right now, in First Corinthians two three, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. I think a lot of people speculate that Paul may have been sick. Hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. because it, it mentions he sometimes he had infirmities in Second Corinthians in his next letter. He talks about how his grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly will I boast in my infirmities. That's Second Corinthians twelve nine. Remember how he had to write with big letters? Here's my own handwriting. I'm signing with my, you know, people say that he couldn't see. Yeah, know? they said he had scribes. <laughs> well. This is all, it, all this stuff we're saying, by the way, is commentary. It's not straight out of the scripture. But yeah. you, you can kind of piece it together from reading all the different letters of Paul. What would happen is he had people write his letters, but he would sign at the end with so his then, own signature. Right. Yeah, Sylvain. He would he would sign him at the end is to keep it from being forged to to show difference because he had he had problems later on with some of his letters being forged. People saying that they were Paul, so he had, yeah he had to shoot that down. Yeah. Now, um, and sometimes sometimes the weakness, you know, it it turned out to further the gospel. You know, his God would show up and show off oftentimes. All then. Right. Now, here's some more stuff. I mean, I really love this chapter, and I think this is a great chapter to start off Blab because it shows that the wisdom of man is not going to cut it uh, when it comes to salvation. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians right. chapter 2, verse 4, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of the Spirit in power. That's right. People yeah. raised from the dead and people... Right. Heal. Amen. Paul, There's a lot of things going on. Paul, let, let's let's talk about the thrust of Conrad Rocks. So I'm always talking about Paul before Acts chapter 9. Okay. Mm -hmm. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, which is a top theologian. He had letters under his arms to persecute Christians. Okay. These Jews, they had learned in man's wisdom. They were not engaged in the spirit of Christ. They didn't know the author, and that's what... As, as the menu points to the food, the Bible points to the author. There's a spirit. Uh, he writes later that all, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, which means it's God-breathed by holy men. Now, before Acts chapter 9, he was operating in man's wisdom. The, the stone which the builders rejected has now become the head of the corner, 
right? So the, the, right. Apex, the apex of the theology of the Jews was the Messiah that they were constructing of their own intellect, right? They were doing precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, Isaiah 28, 10, 11, somewhere around there. And they were constructing their own Messiah, what they thought. Mm -hmm. And then that all got scrapped. Once they once yeah. he met Jesus, he's like, whoa. And he said after that, I if you read Galatians chapter one, he says, Man, I know I no longer conferred with flesh and blood. <laughs> no, they're leading me down the wrong path. Right? Jesus taught him. Yeah. So then then he went and he said, I got the I, the Lord taught me directly, Galatians chapter one. Mm -hmm. So he learned that the enticing words of man's wisdom gets you nowhere. It's just, nowhere. it's futile debate. Now, but in demonstration of the spirit and in power, in Mark 16, you know, this is just, there's signs of an apostle. He talks about, I have the signs of the apostle in one, one letter. But in Mark 16, at the end, Jesus is talking about these signs shall fl uh, follow them that believe. Okay. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They'll speak new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He did all those things. There was, there was a serpent. It doesn't say, That's the, right. it doesn't say, this is pretty interesting too. It doesn't say they will pray to me and I'll cast out devils. So mm -hmm. they'll, they'll do it. They'll cast I'm, I'm thinking about how Paul, when that serpent jumps up on his hand, it's a viper that's supposed to kill him. He doesn't pray. He just shakes it off. And that doesn't hurt him. That's right. And it and Jesus is saying here, it doesn't say pray to me in these things. You know, you'll you'll have yeah, it. And the girl, the Python spirit, the Python spirit in chapter sixteen of Acts, he just said he cast it out. He didn't Yeah, it's interesting that we don't do a lot of this the same way today. Makes you wonder, but the they did speak directly. They would say, Well, Peter, I'm not talking about Paul with Peter, when the man asked him for alms at the gate, he said, no, um, I don't have any money, but what I do have, I give you, rise and be healed. He didn't pray. He just said, do it. And the guy did it. Amen. So. Uh, Williams is saying, William, Will Simmons is saying that weakness <laughs> is Athenian. It means feebleness or he was sick, basically. Yeah infirmity all right so i kind of think that's the whole thrust of, of chapter two here is god's power yeah. um verse five that your faith should not stand in wisdom of men but in the power of god now first off you know a lot of, I've, I've i've talked to people before and they say well you know i do apologetics because i want people to believe and basically when you get into apologetics discussion on any any video format, you're not going to win the person over that you're talking to, but the people on the sidebar, you know, that's who you're talking. That's, yeah, yeah. that's why you're engaging in that conversation. So yeah. I, then, then you can, you can possibly go to the sower sows the word parable, but the thing is that's not intellect. It's the sower sowing the word. So some people sow, some people water, but God gives the increase. Amen. So when you're engaging with an unbeliever and you, and you you're sowing the word, that word, you know, it doesn't sprout a tree the next day. It's so, it's, if it goes into their heart, if you read Mark chapter four, there, Satan sends fowls of the air to steal the word it was sown in their heart. You know, if it's sown on good soil, uh, you, you get up every day, you go to sleep, and pretty soon you'll see some fruit of it. You might get a phone call when their wife or husband is sick, and they're like, you know, I know money can't save my dad. I need, right. I need Jesus to it's do a an miracle. encounter. And uh, yeah, so it's an encounter. Yeah, and it, one thing I want to talk about here: the church as a whole, especially in America, and since that's probably where most of our audience is right now, um, we have really kind of dropped the ball on this part of the Bible. We have used a lot of worldly influence i guess you could say a lot of worldly advice to kind of creep into the church and it all seems so innocent and it seems so good you know but if you really truly examine most of the advice the world gives us 
even the good advice that we get from the world. When you examine it in the light of Scripture and through the power of the Holy Spirit, you find out, shockingly, that most of that advice is just about the opposite of what the Holy Spirit would have us do. And I think that's where we kind of miss it in the church. We, we spend so much time trying to make our world fit the Bible instead of molding our world, our, our own, you know, how we live and how we interact and what we do, try to fit what we do into not just what the Bible says, but what the Spirit leads us to do. Because it's not just reading text in a book to determine how to act because it, it's never going to be like, it's not like that. It's like the Holy Spirit is directing us and the word is what he uses to do that. So I, got, I really hope that whoever's listening to this gets that if they don't get anything else that we talk about tonight, it's so much more than just text on a page. I got a it's an encounter with God. I got a That's perfect what example. There's this story, and we heard it not too long ago. This is a famous story. There's a guy that does the tightrope walking with the wheelbarrow. Oh yeah. He goes all he That's goes. Yeah, check it out. He's going across. He's going across. I don't know if Niagara Falls or something. And he gets to one side, and he goes, you know, to the people, "Hey, do you believe I can uh, do it with somebody in it?" <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, and we believe. And yeah, yeah, we believe you can do it with somebody. You really do? Do you really believe it? Yeah, we really, really believe it. Well, why don't you jump in then? And nobody wants to jump in. So, so the it's difference easy to say you believe, yeah. The difference is, I mean, that's kind of an example of knowing some text. The text is outside on your kitchen table. It's on your your living room table, and it's collecting dust. Just having it there outside you does you no good. You've got to get it inside you, and you have to, like, that's when John, John the Revelator and Ezekiel, he says, you know, you need to eat the scroll. It's going to be good in your mouth, but when you get it in your, in your belly, stomach. you're accountable. You know it. But the only thing is, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You don't, the, the truth on the kitchen table is not a weapon. Once it's in you, the sword of the Spirit's the word of God. you got to get the word in you. If you abide in the vine, if my words abide in you, then you'll be my disciples indeed and ask what you will. You know, we got to abide in the word. And then, then we have the power that the word talks about. But, you know, how much faith, faith in some text, in some, in, in, there's another thing too, intellectual assent, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. Oh, I intellectually understand that Jesus is Lord. Or did that is the devil. Okay. <laughs> so the demons believe in, in tremble too. That's in James. You believe there's one God, so do the demons. They fear and tremble. You know? And he talks about faith. Shall such faith save you? Well, and then he keeps talking about faith without works is dead. So, in other words, put your feet to your faith. That's true. Now, That's the good. power of God, the power of God, all the disciples died. All of them. They, John. They, they chose well, and he should have died. But he eventually died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were martyred. That's right. So, so in other words, they had an encounter with Christ. Um, exactly. Verse six. Um, how be it we speak among wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of the world, nor the princes of the world that come to naught. He's basically talking about here people that are perfect in the in the uh, scriptures, and I, I call this kitchen room kitchen. Table kitchen table theology. Yeah. yeah, because there's some things that I like. I have an inner circle email. Okay. This is for podcasts that are too deep for the public. You know, I'm like, on you know, yeah. this this is a word specifically for the people that you know around the kitchen table. Because the public it Jesus says don't cast your pearls before swine. And that's the that's the the premise here. Um, we speak wisdom, the wisdom of God among them, which are perfect. I I don't think that's today's contemporary vernacular for me. I would say, hey, we we talk the deep things of God around the kitchen table. That's how I yeah. would say it. Yeah, but in the the world cannot understand God. Period. There's only one way to understand God, and that's to have God in you, and and that's that's why. It, that, and that's one reason I don't really debate apologetics at all because I. I only do it like you said if I think somebody else is watching 
that's already seeking. Because if you're talking to somebody who's lost and arguing like that, you are being, you are not getting anywhere. They cannot see it. Their their spiritual eyes are closed. Once and what happens is it's always an encounter, and it could be something tragic and that's sadly usually what happens something happens in a person's life and they realize that this life is temporary and there's got to be more and they realize that and when that comes then they start seeking and then as soon as they ask the, the bible says if you seek me you will find me when you seek me with all your heart so god makes a way to open their vision at that point but you really need to be careful about getting drug in. If you're a Christian, getting drugged down that path of arguing with people who don't believe in God. Because really, to be honest, you're probably falling in their trap. You're not really accomplishing anything for them or yourself or the kingdom. Make sure the Holy Spirit directs you to do those things before you jump in too quick. I wanted to acknowledge by his wounds, he says that it's very true. I do apologetics, but it's for teaching those truly seeking. Now, I, right. I want to go ahead and echo that by his wounds because that's a very good point. When I first got saved, now I was, I was, I was, I heard from God as a little kid. It's a long story. You should check out the about me on my page. It's like a nine minute testimony, but, um, my dad taught me how to pray, and then the world peer pressure kind of got me off into the world and denying that voice that that's constantly in our. You know how we know things that are nowhere. We know there's a God, but we suppress it. You know, alcohol, drugs, peer pressure, whatever. We just want to drown it out. You know, but then when I got saved, when I had my encounter in 1995, when I was truly born again, I'm like going, "Wow, okay." I met God. Now let's do the apologetic thing because I have to catch up. <laughs> you know, Paul. Paul met Jesus in Acts chapter nine. And he went to the deserts of Arabia. He goes, yeah. "Wait a minute! I got to get my head. I got to get my head wrapped around this. I know what's going on." And then, yeah, it changes. You're a new creature in Christ. So then I started reading things like uh, Josh McDowell stuff like that. I'm like, going, "Oh, okay, okay." They pointed to the Bible in, the, in its wonder, and it's amazing. Yeah. So um, let's continue on here, I guess. Um, the next verse. verse seven. Yeah, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now, the wisdom, the, the mystery that he's talking about, these are things hidden in the text that, that people just didn't, see god it god yeah. god held yeah. it and i want to stop here because you know that is kind of interesting that the people who knew more bible than anyone the pharisees and the sadducees that's all they did was you know read the word study the word knew the word that that was their life yet all those scriptures that they read they could not could not or would not see it in Jesus, could not see Jesus as the Messiah, even though he fulfilled so much of the prophecy of that day. It was confounding to them because he just did not fit the model their theology had built. They had a whole system of theology that had one idea of what the Messiah was supposed to look like. And even though all these scriptures pointed to Jesus and all these different passages pointed to Jesus, they couldn't see those for what they were. And you know, it makes you wonder how much of our own theology is the same. How much of our own theology have we built up and made into something that isn't pointing to the real Jesus, but it's pointing to some idea that someone's planted in our head. Amen. Williams was pointing out the, uh, the fact that these were babes in Christ. Yeah. And, and you know, there, there's that <laughs> there's good. that pro, there's that proverb here's here's something we can kind of address i don't want to go down the rabbit trail too far but there's a proverb that says you know where, where there's an ox your stall is going to be messy okay but the idea is to have an ox because you can get some plowing done amen you, you know what i'm saying and a lot of it's like we want to kick out people with weak theology and that's kind of being arrogant you know yeah. you know you gotta you gotta treat them as babes in christ amen um, amen yeah, I, yeah. It, by his words, said, I like how Jesus addressed the experts in Scripture, the scribes and the Pharisees. Have you not read? And like, yeah, they, they awesome. read. Uh, yeah, it's awesome. 
Because he's like pointing out, you guys have read all these scriptures. What have you not? You're missing the point. The funny thing is they had it memorized memorized more than likely. Yeah. Anyway. That's right. Okay. Um, But God ordained before the world to our glory. The next verse is, you know, first off in the wisdom thing, I keep thinking of Matthew 13. It's somewhere around Matthew 13, something about the the treasure. Uh, The pearl? No, it's the one where the scribe, let me see if I can find it. It's Matthew 13, 51, 52. Jesus said, have you understood all these things? They say unto him, yea, Lord. Then said he to him, therefore every scribe which is instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which bringeth forth of his treasure new things and old. So, you know, we keep finding new things out of the same text. I don't care how many times you read the same text. All of a sudden, the spirit of truth makes a little bam and lights it up and says, this is what it means. And you're like, yeah, I've read it a thousand times, but now I get it. And then you can read uh, it. Then you can read it or again. you get something else on top of it, which get, makes it even more fun. I like our pastor, Chris, and the church that we're in. He is always doing that. He will come up with something that you're like, wow, it does say that. Uh, he really gets you to examine scripture in a new, fresh way. So I, I really enjoy that when you get something and then it's just a giant revelation that just kind of unlocks the meaning of the whole thing. And here's the funny thing is you get the revelation and then you try to carnally convey it to somebody else. And they're like, uh, I don't have any uh, idea what you're uh, talking about. I don't get it. Uh, I don't get it. <laughs> You're like, yeah, oh no. man, that's what that's what he's talking about. I don't confer with flesh and blood. Spiritually <laughs> discerned. I don't know. Yeah. Somebody's gotta be reve- it's gotta be revealed to each of us. There are things that only the Holy Spirit can teach us. And yeah, the Spirit we'll, searcheth all things. Will echoed that. I can read it over and over and then bam. I didn't see see something I didn't see before. That's the Holy Spirit. He makes the word alive. Now yeah. if, in verse eight, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He's talking about the Jewish scholars. They didn't know it. They had the text memorized, but they didn't know. Amen. Verse 9, he's talking about, uh, as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Uh, He's referring to Isaiah 64, 4. I, I wrote that in my notes, and I don't know what that says. Some people, some I was looking at some commentaries. They were t- talking about the apocalypse of Elijah. I didn't know he had one, but I bet that would be good. Uh, yeah, he's referring to Isaiah 64, 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath seen, O God, besides thee, what he had prepared for them that waited for him. Yeah. They didn't, the whole idea of the Holy Spirit, God in man, the whole idea that the church would become the body of Christ in the earth. I mean, that really kind of blew their minds. That was not something the theologians of that day could accept. Um, And they fought Jesus so hard for many reasons, but the main reason is because they were holding so tightly to their tradition. They were holding on so tightly to what they really believed was true, even if what he was telling them he was he was quoting the scripture. Jesus was quoting the scripture. He says, "Don't you know?" And they could not. They would not. They would not see because they didn't want to let go of their own thinking. We have to be careful. I know we do it. I know I've done it. I can't count the things in the past probably five years that I've had to revisit and breathe and let the Holy Spirit change my thinking because I was stuck. I was stuck in thinking a thing that was not true, and I just didn't see it. How about, I mean, we could break this down for quite some time. Entered into the heart of man. Man, dude, you know how something, Jesus said, let this sink into your ears. For them that have ears to hear, let them hear. Let them hear, that's good. This is all, This your ear goes to your brain, and your brain drops to your heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. he. Let me tell you what's going on. You're watching TV. (laughs) I'm going to mess with some people here. But Krugman, a guy, nobody likes him, but he did some research back in the 60s about how in the first 30 seconds of watching TV, you go into alpha brainwave state. You, You just 
you, it's called shut hypnosis. Off your you shut off mm -hmm. your thinking. And this is the reason I turned off my TV. I could go plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what are, I mean, relatively quickly, but I couldn't quote as much scriptures. I could commercials or jingles. And I'm like going, oh my gosh, this is in my heart. And I'm going, man, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So these things are entering our Your heart. spirit, yeah. They're entering. So we've got to watch, you know, if we can't, if we look at a woman and lust after, then we think about it. He's already committed adultery in his heart. Mm -hmm. It starts with a look. So we have to watch what our eye, uh, what we see with our eyes and what we hear with our ears because it'll go through and get into our heart. Isn't that something? That's something to think about. Yeah. And how yeah. much of our culture is shaped through television? How much of the culture around us is shaped by radio, by our schools, by all these things? We do so many things. We don't even really stop and ask the Holy Spirit. Most of the time, we just do these things because our families and our friends and our neighbors, everyone's doing these things, and they seem like good things to do. Well, of course I'm going to go to this or do this. Um, why wouldn't I? But if you really have to stop and think about it, we have kind of left God out of the mix. We've made lots of choices for ourselves, but none of those choices are directed by the Holy Spirit, and then we wonder why we end up in the mess we're in. That may be why. That, well, that is why, according to the word. It's it's we got to watch what we put in our eyes and our ears because it gets mm -hmm. it gets into our heart. And guess how mm -hmm. else it gets into your children's heart too. For those of you that babysit your children in front of the TV, I mean, just oh, don't no, please stop. It's so dangerous. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. now here's something that I kind of wanted to talk about for a minute. I know we're at verse nine. We got about twenty minutes left. Um, for them that love him, these things I. It's written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. How do you love God? How do you do it? It's an you encounter. What he says. It's you, what he says. Yeah, but can you can you love text? I mean, can you have yeah. intellectual assent and like, I believe Jesus is Lord and I'm gonna love him? No, it's it's it becomes it becomes real that you find out that he cares for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his begotten son, you know? It's it's when it becomes real that he cares for you. He does. He cares for your welfare, he cares for your children. When you love a person in the flesh that's here for in front of you, how do you love them? You love them by listening, by being in their presence, by desiring to know more about them. By fellowship, those are things that you do. All those things apply to Jesus. Right. Jesus desires our fellowship, our presence, our acknowledgement. He desires our praise. Yeah. Now, our companionship. He loves those things. Yeah. By his wounds is making it kind of echoing another scary point, but that but I agree with him. Once you catch this revelation, I've seen many people that are more careful with their Bible than they are with their relationship with Jesus, who is the author of the Bible. That's right. So That's what good. I was going to say in, in Psalms, it says we enter his courts with thanksgiving. We enter his gates with thanksgiving. We enter his courts with praise. I think it's a Psalm 100. That's right. Psalm 100. 100.4. I think it was an FM station. But the deal is, I'm going to tell you something. As you, when you fall in love with a spouse or something, you want to be in their presence. You don't want to just read their letter. Yeah. You don't want to just read their letter, even though it's a love letter. The love letter is like, hey, I can't wait till I see him. So That's right. with me, I have an encounter during worship, and I'm a worshiper, so I could talk about it for quite some time. But I love getting into the presence of God, and He changes you. He change when you spend time worshiping God uh, through music, however, um, mm -hmm. He changes you. You cannot be the same once you Amen. get into the presence of God. That's good. That's true. All and right. that is how you foster the relationship th with Jesus. You do it. Through praise, through worship, through prayer, through meditation, through the scripture, yeah, he, all those things. But the Bible, some people put the Bible as their primary thing, and the Bible is an awesome thing. I'm not criticizing the Bible. I think all of us probably need to read way more Bible. Um, and we try to read at least, what, twice a day? And 
We do a study a couple of times a week, but I do more than that. <laughs> well, more than that, we do several. I mean, he's reading it all day. I'm I'm working all day, so I don't read it all day, but yeah. every day we read it. Um, it's important. It's a big part of your life if you're a believer. Amen. It should be a huge part of your life if you're a believer. Yeah, it actually keeps you alive. It generates. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like food for your soul. You need it. Yeah. First Corinthians two ten, but God hath revealed the, them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the th deep things of God. Now, this is the spiritual things. This understand. Do you realize that truth is a person? There's the Spirit of Truth, and Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, and life." We can have. There's so many versions. There's so many different perspectives about the same event, but Jesus is the truth, and it takes the carnal mind has a hard time dealing with that. But after you go, oh, I get it. Then you have to, it's like, you cannot build your own building blocks in theology and get to God. But once you have a relationship with God, he starts dropping these little building blocks together. You know, there can be no other foundation laid than Christ. So then you start working with your precepts, but he's got to give them to you. That's why Paul says, forget the flesh and blood thing. I'm going to go, go hang out and get my revelation from the Lord directly. The, mm -hmm. spirit, the spirit searches the deep things. Of God. Now let's talk about the deep things of God. I instantly think of an ocean. The ocean, the dark, deeper you go, you can't see, right? Unless you have a light. So the spirit seems to illuminate those deep things. Mm -hmm. Amen. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. You need to have a light, and the spirit is like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the less you've got of the world in you, too, the deeper you can go. Right. That's important to know too. Hanging on to the world makes it pretty tough to go deeper with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah, God revealed them to us by by his spirit. I think mm -hmm. Paul was talking about he, we could not get there through carnal deduction. We couldn't mm -hmm. the carnal mind the carnal mind is at enmity with God. I think that's somewhere in Romans. Uh, yes. when you read that it fights God, it can understand spiritual things are spiritual discerned. So that's kind of where he's at, what he's echoing here. Um, first Corinthians two eleven. for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man, which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. That's what I was saying earlier. When you're testifying to people who are lost and frustrated that they don't understand spiritual things, they can't. God has made it so that they can't. So don't get frustrated with them. Just keep praying that they're that they will receive Christ, receive Jesus, so that they can be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that they can receive that truth. So we sometimes go about things backward. We try to convince people of the truth. When they can't be convinced of the truth, they need the truth, the spirit. And then the truth will be that comes naturally then. Amen. You know, one of the scriptures I was thinking about was Ephesians 2.18. Um, let me read this verse again so it kind of makes sense. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Notice how the spirit is mentioned twice. If we go over to Ephesians 2.18, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. yep. I I think that's it's kind of like a tuning fork. You know, it, when when the truth comes from the throne and I'm here and Susan's there and we both catch the the spiritual football at the same time, there's this knowing in your knower that both mm -hmm. rings too, and you both get excited about it at the same time. Mm -hmm. okay. And this, is, I want to bring that up again. I mentioned this earlier. Uh, it happens a lot, and and we've seen we, maybe because we're pr kind of prophetic people, we get into that stuff anyway. But it's super interesting when the Holy Spirit illuminates a scripture, and you get all excited about it. And then I'm talking to Conrad. He's all excited about it. We're talking about it. And something, just some revelation about a scripture comes. And then we get online. 
and somebody else is talking about it and somebody else. It's like we've not talked to these people, but all at the same time, it's like God is dealing with something specific and he begins to reveal it to the church all over the world. And even different cultures are still talking about the same stuff. It's really awesome to see the Holy Spirit move. And my desire as a Christian is to see more of that in the church, where we are not driven by programs and men and institutions, but we're driven by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and reveals things to us, and we work under his Lord, under the Lordship of Jesus, we work in that way. And we don't try to fit everything into the, I don't know. I just get really excited when yeah. other people are yeah. hearing the same things, doing the same things. And we don't, it's like, you're not talking to these people. They don't even know who you are. Yeah. So you know for sure, there's no way we got this from them or they got this from us. This came from the Holy Spirit. The same information at the same time. It's really an awesome thing. Amen. Like I was going to periscope the other day. I behave that way. I do. Yeah. Dr. Robert Nolan was periscoping while I was out praying about the same verse. I mean, it's amazing. He was It happens. We we had the same topic. Ryan Lestrange does it a lot. I'll be doing a podcast. That one happens constantly. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And the deal is um, um, this confirmation out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, every matter should be established. Man, we have nine minutes left. Will Sim- Simmons is talking about the cautious route, and this is very wise. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they're of God, because many false prophets are out in the world. Yeah, you got to try them. That's right. And when, and on the flip side, what he says is true, too. When I turn into some show and this person's talking, and I'm like, nothing that you're saying is bearing witness and nobody else is talking about this scripture right now. And I'm wondering, are they off in left field? Is that really the Holy Spirit? It makes you wonder. And, and you know, we really shouldn't jump on that bandwagon if no other Christian is getting the same revelation. We should be careful. Amen. Um, next verse. Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. There's a contrary spirit to God called the spirit of the world. Mm-hmm. Isn't it interesting that the world has a spirit? Now, I will say we can find that there's uh, principalities, like there's the Prince of Persia over Daniel's region. Daniel fasted and prayed the 21-day fast, right? It wasn't the fact that it was 21 days. He fasted until he got an answer, but that eventually brought down the principality of Persia. There's there's right. there's principalities all throughout Scripture. God's even sets them up in Revel, uh, Romans 13. I mean, and Jesus said, when the disciples came back to him and asked, "Why was it we could not cast this out?" and he says, "This one comes out, not out, but by prayer and fasting." Right, but the principality over the region is uh, that's kind of where I was going with this. But there's a okay. there's a worldly there's a worldly spirit. Mm-hmm. It's very counter to God, and it's very much permeated the church. I mean, when you go into the church, you look up, there's a stage. There's people performing on stage, people clap in the middle. Well, that's the world. It's, yeah. it's fulfilling. Jesus a, never did those things. That's right. The, it does make you wonder the five, why we do. The five I wills in Isaiah, I will exalt myself above the congregation. Rece- you know, it's basically receiving worship like the Most High. And, and it's like going, oh, I see that. And there's a really good book that we read, Pagan Christianity, right? By Frank Viola and George Barna. Oh, man. You'll see all the stuff that we do in the churches today, the pews and the immobile pews, the wheat. We've we've adopted. And then in part of the problem, this is the problem. It's a spiritual problem because we've invited the enemy into our midst by doing all this stuff. And I, I, I don't think it's... God is still using the church in spite of a lot of this. He's using people who are faithful and love him in spite of a lot of this. But we do a lot of things to ourselves that really serve no purpose. And that is one of them. We do a lot of things that our services, which I'm not even sure where services came from because they're not really in the scripture like that either. But yeah, we do a lot of things in the church that aren't necessarily scriptural, but that's kind of our passion. It is our ministry to help people wake up to some of the things that they do that are not productive, that are not helpful. Um, not that 
you know, no, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. We, Jesus loves us even in our imperfections and in our bad choices. And he, but he desires a closer connection to us. He wants a closer relationship. And so part of the ministry Conrad has, and I have, is to get people to that point where they realize, you know, there's a lot more to this than just showing up once a week to church. There really is a lot more to this living as a Christian. And that's why we're here. Amen. Um, let's see. Where were we? Spirit of the world. I might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Um, which things also speak not in the words which man he's echoing this again. Echo. Man's mm -hmm. wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Um, Amen. Yeah, the Holy Ghost teaches the Spirit of Truth will guide you in all truth. You all, he will uh, bring to remembrance whatsoever Jesus has told you. He will also show you things to come. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And even if you go back into the Old Testament, there's so many Psalms about the. He will direct that path. He's a light, a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. He will tell you which way to go in. Is it Isaiah? I will. You will hear a whisper, a voice. I think it's mentioned more than once. I can't remember the scripture, but I just actually, I just posted it on Facebook, I think, this week. I can't even remember the reference. But he will tell you the direction to go. We just sometimes are so full of noise. We've got so much racket in our life. Our radio's blaring, our TV's on, our kids are screaming. God wants to direct your steps. So we need that time away, that quiet, even if it's just for a few minutes. We need that every single day. To allow the Holy Spirit I, to direct our I path. Wanna, I want to deal with co-pastor Jen's comment because I think she might have got off on what what I know what you meant. She's saying, "So do you believe that praise and worship has its place in the worship service?" Oh yeah. Well, but it's not. My issue was not anything wrong with praise, worship, dance, whatever, whatever you can find in the Bible that people have done to glorify the Lord, I think it's awesome. I've got no trouble with that. My concern has nothing to do with any of that. My concern is the structure that has been placed upon the church service that didn't come out of the Bible. That's my concern. My concern is we have a ritual that we go through where we do three songs, we take up an offering, we do this, we do announcements, we have a sermon, we do these things week after week. And it's like, where did this stuff come from? You know, really, when you look at it, there's no, there's none of that, at least not in that structure in the Bible. Most of the Bible, we were, they were family. They were tight knit. They were a community. They spent time in each other's homes. They, they broke bread and ate meals together and, and talked about Jesus and, and talked about the word of God. And I think we're missing that. That's all I'm saying. I think that's what the church is really supposed to be more like. And the service is kind of taken all that out and we've replaced it with a one meeting a week kind of thing. And I, that's my yeah, concern. Let me, I'm, I'm paying attention to sidebar here. Um, and met in people's homes, not in a church building. See, mm -hmm. see, the deal is I put it over here, Acts 13, okay? Right. This is one of the ways they had church. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work. They waited on the Lord, and then the Holy Ghost awesome. gave them stuff to do. Do we do that in today's church? Today's church, it's three songs, a sermon, <laughs> get out by lunch. <laughs> okay. And you it, may not come back again till the next week. I mean, there are most right. churches are down to one service a week and there's no community. You barely know the people. You sit and face the back of someone's head. Right. You might even, not even have a conversation. Even the very I'm structure, even the very structure is counterintuitive to the way they met in the early church. Yeah. So I, I put the link to pagan Christianity in there just so you go, yep. you know, this will challenge. It's not about the Easter Bunny. Yeah, don't read it if you're sensitive. You might get upset. It's, just... it's, it's not about the Easter Bunny and Halloween and all that stuff. It's actually no. about a lot of the pagan things that we've adopted in our current church service. You go, well, why do we do that? And you go, why well, we it's not in the Bible. And that, that's no. it. But, but check you it out. need to be careful. And I want to say this because I've seen too many people do this. When you read books like this, it does open your eyes, but you have to be, what's the word? You have to be patient and sensitive 
because there's so most people have no clue any of this is a problem. They don't even see church. They think this is just the way church should be. They've never really pondered the fact that none of these things happen in the Bible. They don't get it. They don't see it. So try to be patient with your brother and sister and don't leave your church for goodness sake. Do not do that. Stay in your church. Love your your church family and give um, them opportunities to take it outside that service. That's how we that's how we approach this. We are a member of a, I guess you could say, traditional church, and we love our church family. But we do try to offer opportunities to move it outside Susan, the four walls. Susan, it's eight o'clock. What I'm going to do is let's finish this part. But I want to yeah. I want to go off the recording and deal with some of the comments. Pastor Jen, I want to talk to you after, but I'm going to, let's finish the Bible study here. We will. Just go ahead and read through. Uh, but the natural man, and he's echoing again, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Romans 8, 7 says that. I mean, you cannot understand it. There's really like, you're trying to figure out how they got the animals on the boat or how the <laughs> molecules came out in the Big Bang. Yeah, you're it, lost. It, you're it, like, what? You need the Spirit. You know, you need the Spirit. But he that spiritual judges all things, yea, himself is judged of no man. For who can know the mind of the Lord that may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let's pray out. Okay. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining this Bible study. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah, you, you can follow me. I'm on Keep Twitter. Questions. I'm most, most radical man on Twitter, right? And if you want to email me, I'm uh, Conrad at ConradRocks.net. That's for prayer requests uh, or whatever, you know. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for... Let me calm down. This opportunity to chew on your word. Lord, I thank you for the work that you've done. Lord, I thank you that you've reached through eternity to touch my heart to touch the minds and the hearts of the people in this lab. Lord, I thank you that you have the transforming power that refreshes, renews, restores. Lord, I thank you that people will come to know you through this, not just what we said here, but the people in the sidebar. Lord, I thank you that they have a heart for you. Lord, I pray that, that you touch their lives. Lord, I pray that you restore those lost loved ones, Lord. I pray that those answers, that those questions that they ask you in the night season, why, Lord, why? Lord, I pray that that gentle hush of the Holy Spirit comforts them. Lord, you, you said your word, you are the comforter. Lord, I pray that you comfort these people. Lord, those people with the minds that are just racing to and fro, just racing and searching frantically for an answer. Lord, I pray that you say peace to that storm. And you give them the peace that surpasses all understanding. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray that the people in this broadcast, that you give them the faith that when they look into your eyes, they'll find out that they're walking on water. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for the people who are tuned in right now and the people that will watch this video later. That you just open their eyes to see that you're right there. Mm. Lord, if they seek you, all they have to do is ask. That you've promised that those who seek you will find you. Lord, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to share your good news. That we live in a day where we can sit in our own homes and read your word aloud. And we can share it with people all over the planet with the click of a button. Amen. And Lord, I pray that none of the words that have been spoken tonight will be will return void, Amen. but they will accomplish the purpose for which they were sent. Amen. Lord, I pray that you will take those who are listening right now who have accepted you as their Savior, Lord, that you will give, you will prick their spirit, Lord, that you will draw them even closer, Lord, so that they will step into the call that you have on their life, that they will understand that there's so much more so much more to life than just going to a service or, or, or talking about you or reading words about you, Lord, but to encounter your presence every day. Lord, give us wisdom and guidance and, and guide us in everything that we do and say.
And let everything we do and say be for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's it for the recording. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Till we meet again, dig deeper.